Hello there, fellow coffee lovers. Today we're going to talk about Let's Coffee Better with today's sponsor, Trade Coffee, the iconic red trade bag. It's a gateway to incredible coffee. Trade connects you to 450 coffees from top roasters all over the US so you can brew better coffee right in the comfort of your own home. Now, imagine waking up to a tantalizing variety of over 250 coffees from dark roasts that hug your taste buds to velvety espresso that perks you right up and blends so magical they'll whisk you away. Discover new craft coffee with every delivery. Trade Coffee offers a seamless coffee service, bringing you the best beans from more than 55 top roasters. It's like a never-ending treasure trove for your taste buds, ensuring you savor your best cup of coffee at home every day. With Trade's expert matching algorithm, your coffee is curated for you. They've got flexible subscription plans and an impressive range of roasts tailored to your unique preferences. And you know what's even better? These coffees are roasted fresh to order. Within 48 hours of being roasted, they're shipped straight to your doorstep. Freshness guaranteed. And you know what's even sweeter? Free shipping, customizable plans, and anytime cancellation. You can get a free bag of coffee with any subscription. Just go to drinktrade.com forward slash brain food or click the link below. And now today's video. Picture in your mind a generic airplane. Chances are your mental image will include the following feet. A long tubular fuselage, two symmetrical wings, a tail with one vertical and two symmetrical horizontal stabilizers, a cockpit at the front, and either one engine in the nose or one or more under each wing. And this is the platonic ideal of an aircraft. Sleek, simple, functional. Now feast your eyes on these monstrosities. Now, before you go running to the comments, these are not Photoshop manipulations by trolls looking to trigger our inner OCD tendencies, but real aircraft that have actually flown. While the general rule in engineering and design is that if it looks right, it is right, this is not always the case. Sometimes the vagaries of design requirements and the eccentricities of physics can combine to create something that looks completely off, yet still somehow works. This is the weird and wonderful history of asymmetric aircraft, among the strangest vehicles to ever take to the skies. From the dawn of aviation, engineers have endeavored to make aircraft as symmetric as possible. Intuitively, this makes sense. After all, this is how birds evolved, and aerodynamic symmetry means an aircraft handles similarly in every direction, making it easier to pilot. But as designers began to better understand the intricacies of aerodynamics, they realized that their adherence to symmetry was largely arbitrary, and that breaking from it could, in certain circumstances, lead to significant improvements in performance. Perhaps the first truly asymmetric aircraft to successfully fly was the Gotha G6, built by German aircraft firm Gotha Wagenfabrik in 1918. The brainchild of designer Hans Burkhardt, the G6 was an attempt to improve the performance of German heavy bombers, which in the waning days of the Great War were becoming increasingly vulnerable to newer Allied fighter aircraft. At the time, nearly all heavy bombers used the same basic design. A central fuselage housing the crew, bomb load and defensive guns, and two outboard nacelles on the wings housing the engines and propellers. Earlier in the war, Burkhard realized that this configuration was inefficient, and that if the number of drag-producing bodies were reduced, speed, range, and bomb load could be significantly improved. Burkhard received a patent for his ideas in September 1915, but while the German government was not interested at first, by late 1917, bomber losses had become so severe that Burkhard finally received permission to build his unusual design. Starting with a conventional Gotha G5 heavy bomber, Burkhard eliminated one of the engine nacelles and moved the engine and propeller to the front of the fuselage. He then moved the cockpit and gun positions to a separate pod mounted outboard on the wing, which was fitted with a second engine and pusher propeller to balance out the thrust from the first. The propellers were placed as close together as possible to reduce thrust asymmetry should one engine fail, while the geometry of the wings and tail were adjusted to balance out all aerodynamic forces. The G6 first flew in the summer of 1918, and despite its bizarre appearance, performed surprisingly well, displaying greater speed, range, and endurance than its conventional predecessors. About its only serious flaw was a severe flutter in the rear fuselage, which Burkhard quickly corrected using a new asymmetric tailplane design. However, during one of the early test flights, the first prototype nosed over on landing and was damaged beyond repair. The second prototype was started, but the armistice of November 1918 was signed before it could be completed. Shortly thereafter, Gotha destroyed the aircraft instead of handing it over to the military Inter-Allied Commission of Control. It appears was ahead of his time, for the next significant asymmetric aircraft design would not appear for another 20 years. In 1937, the German Reich's Air Ministry, or RLM, issued a specification for a single-engine tactical reconnaissance aircraft with maximum all-round visibility for the pilot and crew. An early front-runner for the contract was the Arado AR-198, but its performance during flight tests disappointed and the project was scrapped. This left an opening for an unexpected candidate to enter the competition. Blom & Voss, a shipbuilder and aircraft manufacturer, 
manufacturer based in Hamburg, was best known for its successful seaplanes and flying boats, and had produced relatively few land plane designs. However, one of his engineers, Dr. Richard Voigt, came up with a unique proposal for meeting the RLM's requirements for a reconnaissance aircraft. Thus, while the company was not formally invited to enter the competition, Blom and Voss decided to pursue the contract as a private venture. The main difficulty in designing a single-engine reconnaissance aircraft was that placing the engine and propeller ahead of the cockpit obscured the crew's view of the grounds, making the aircraft less effective in its intended role. One solution was to place the engine behind the crew compartment, but this then required the tail to be split into two booms, increasing weight and drag. Pusher configuration engines also tended to suffer from overheating problems. The Arado AR-198 tried to get around this problem by fitting a large glazed observation pod below the fuselage, but this only contributed to the aircraft's poor performance. Richard Voigt, like Hans Burkhard before him, realized that part of the problem lay in the designer's intuitive insistence on making their aircraft perfectly symmetrical. Abandoning this preconception, in 1938, Voigt came up with a truly radical aircraft design, the BV-141. At first glance, the BV-141 looks like a standard twin-boom aircraft, but the closer you look, the stranger it becomes. For one thing, the aircraft actually had only one boom, housing a single 853-horsepower BMW 132N radial engine. The crew Meanwhile, sat in an extensively glazed pod mounted to the right of the boom, which provided unparalleled all-round visibility. Adding to the asymmetry, the outer wing panels were of different lengths, while only a single horizontal stabilizer jutted out of the left side of the boom. Yet despite its headache-inducing layout, the BV-141 flew perfectly well, with the first prototype flown on February 25, 1938, displaying remarkably docile handling characteristics. The aircraft's only major flaw was its temperamental hydraulic system, which led to numerous landing gear failures during test flights. Nonetheless, the unorthodox design proved too much for the RLM, who initially showed little interest in the BV-141. It was not until General Oberst Ernst Udat, legendary World War I flying ace and head of the RLM's research and development department, intervened that a batch of pre-production aircraft were finally ordered for evaluation. But while field trials confirmed the BV-141's excellent performance, by 1943 various practical and political factors conspired to prevent Richard Voigt's innovative aircraft from serving in the Second World War. For example, the choice to power the BV-141 with BMW 132N proved unfortunate, for these engines were soon needed for the more strategically vital Fokker Wolf FW-190 fighter. Additionally, Allied bombing of the Fokker Wolf facility forced the relocation of its production line to Blom & Voss, severely limiting the company's ability to manufacture its own designs. Finally, the RLM decided that the more conventional twin boom Fokker Wolf FW-189 Uhu was a more practical fit for the tactical reconnaissance role, and production of the BV-141 was halted after only 23 airframes had been built. Nonetheless, Richard Vogt continued to experiment with asymmetric aircraft, producing a number of equally innovative designs over the course of the war. Among these was the P-177, a dive bomber version of the BV-141 intended to replace the aging Junker Ju-87 Stuker. It was armed with two forward-firing 15mm automatic cannon and two rear-firing defensive machine guns and could carry up to 2,000 kilograms of bombs. An upgraded B-1 version also featured a Junkers Jump 004B turbojet engine mounted in a pod between the boom and the crew compartment to increase the aircraft's speed and its bomb load. In Voigt's P-194 proposal, this engine was moved to the rear of the crew compartment and helped offset the asymmetric thrust from the propeller. The ultimate development in this series was the P-178, which ditched the piston engine entirely and featured a single jet engine mounted under one wing. This configuration was chosen not only to conserve scarce and expensive jet engines, but also to simplify maintenance, for a wing-mounted engine was easier to access and repair than one mounted in the fuselage. However, due to Germany's worsening strategic and industrial situation, none of Voigt's designs made it past the wooden mock-up stage, and the venerable Stuka soldiered on in the dive-bomber role until the end of the war. But perhaps Richard Voigt's most radical design was the P-202, which introduced the revolutionary concept of the slewed or oblique wing. As we covered in our previous video, Why Do Jets Have Swept Back Wings?, sweeping an aircraft's wings backwards or forwards delays the formation of supersonic shockwaves, improving performance at high subsonic and supersonic speeds. However, this design also reduces the wing's overall lift, resulting in higher takeoff and landing speeds and reduced mobility at low speeds. One solution, also pioneered by the Germans during the Second World War, is the variable geometry or swing wing, which can be swept forward to generate extra lift on takeoff and landing and swept back for higher performance in cruise. But while effective swing wings come with a number of drawbacks, including increased weight and complexity, and a shifting center of lift, causing longer and instability problems. In an oblique wing, like Voigt's P-2020, however, the entire wing pivots as one, with one side sweeping forward and the other rearward. This not only requires a simpler and lighter mechanism than a conventional swing wing, but also prevents the center of lift from shifting and ensures that the wing loses lift from the roots outward, allowing the pilot to maintain control in a stall. 
While the P-202 was never built, after the war, Richard Voigt and his oblique wing research were brought to the United States as part of Operation Paperclip. In the 1970s, NASA began to resurrect the concept by building an unmanned test vehicle called the NASA Oblique Wing and a follow-up manned vehicle called the AD-1. Built of lightweight composites, the AD-1 was powered by a pair of small micro-turbo TRS-8 turbojets and featured a long shoulder-mounted wing that could be rotated up to 60 degrees. The aircraft was flown dozens of times over NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center in the Mojave Desert between 1979, and while it proved that the oblique wing concept was feasible, it also revealed that such aircraft from severe roll pitch coupling, known to pilots as Dutch roll and other instabilities, at wing angles greater than 45 degrees. Following on from this research, in 1991, NASA built a miniature remote controlled demonstration model of a proposed 500 seat supersonic airliner with a swinging oblique wing. Though the model only flew once in May 1994, improvements to the wing design allowed it to achieve stable flight at wing angles up to 50 degrees. Unfortunately, the entire project was cancelled soon after, and while no practical oblique wing aircraft have been built since, the concept is promising enough that research continues in aerodynamics laboratories around the world. When it comes to asymmetrical aircraft, however, few designs can compare in strangeness and genius to the Rutan Boomerang introduced in 1996. Its designer, legendary American engineer Bert Rutan, is no stranger to unorthodox designs. His company, Scale Composites, was responsible for the design of such record-breaking aircraft as the Voyager, which made the first non-stop round-the-world flight in 1986, the Global Flyer, which made the first solo non-stop round-the-world flight in 2005, and Spaceship One, which in 2005 was the first privately built craft to reach outer space. The Boomerang, however, was designed to solve a more mundane problem, the poor safety record of light twin-engine aircraft. As the engines on most twins are spaced widely apart, the loss of one engine creates asymmetric thrust that pulls the aircraft to one side. Even worse, in the event of a stall, this thrust immediately throws the aircraft into a violent spin, with potentially lethal consequences. To counter this effect, Rutan, similar to Burkhard and Voigt, abandoned the conventional fuselage and tuna cells layout, placing one engine in the main fuselage and the other in a separate tail boom. These two engines were then placed as close as possible to each other so that the loss of either one would create only minimal thrust asymmetry. As on the Gotha G6, this configuration also reduces the weight and cross-sectional area of the entire craft, reducing weight and fuel consumption and increasing speed range and endurance. The aircraft's forward-swept wings are another clever safety feature, causing the wing roots to lose lift first in a stall and allowing the pilot to maintain full control of the aircraft. But balancing the aerodynamic forces to compensate for these tricks resulted in a vehicle that looks like it was cobbled together from parts of different aircraft and then allowed to melt in the sun. The cockpit juts out far ahead of the boom, and the left wing is a meter and a half shorter than the right wing, and only the horizontal stabilizer only extends to the right. Even the power plants are asymmetrical, with one producing 10 more horsepower than the other. This, however, was simply the result of those particular engines being available at the time. Thanks to these counterintuitive design choices and the use of lightweight composites in its construction, the Boomerang is significantly safer and more efficient than its closest counterpart, the Beechcraft Baron 58. Despite using less powerful engines and carrying less fuel, at its top speed of 486 km an hour, the Boomerang could fly 65 km per hour faster and 1400 km faster than the Baron while carrying the same number of passengers. Yet despite this achievement, only one Boomerang was ever built, the type being intended more as a technology demonstrator than a commercial product. Nonetheless, Rutan has stated that of the dozens of pioneering aircraft he has designed over his long career, the Boomerang remains his favorite. The Boomerang was not the only asymmetrical aircraft designed by scaled composites. In the late 1980s, the US Army put out a request for a low-cost battlefield attack aircraft, or LCBAA, a simple lightweight ground attack fighter to provide close air support for advancing troops. In response, in 1990, scaled composites modified their long, easy, home-built aircraft design to produce the Agile Responsive Effective Support, or ARIES. Like the much larger Fairchild A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known as the Warthog, Ares was built around a gun, in this case the GAU-12U 25mm rotary cannon. Due to the gun's geometry, the barrel had to be mounted on the right side of the fuselage, where its recoil caused the aircraft to yaw when firing. This was compensated by using a concave recess in the side of the fuselage, which trapped the deflected gun exhaust gases sideways, counteracting its recoil. Another problem that the designers encountered was gun exhaust gases being injected by the engine, causing it to lose power or flame out. This was solved by placing the engine intake on the opposite side of the fuselage from the gun, resulting in an even more asymmetric aircraft. But though Ares performed well, it was only ever a private technology demonstration project and was never adopted by the Army. In conclusion, the fascinating story of asymmetric aircraft teaches us a vital age-old lesson. Never judge a book by its cover, for just because something doesn't look like it should work, doesn't mean it can't work.